All right, now we're joined by Lorena Gonzalez, who's running for City Council position nine. So we'll go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Great. Thank you all for um, being here tonight and how much work this is. Um, I'm Lorena Gonzalez, running for Seattle City Council position nine, which is an at-large citywide seat. I'm really excited about running for um, Seattle City Council, and I wanted to just share a little bit about me. Um, uh, I grew up in central Washington state um, in a micro farm worker family. I went to um, uh, public college at Washington State University, got a degree in business, and then <coughs> moved away for a little bit to Los Angeles and uh, came back here, found my way, came back to uh, Seattle and went to law school in 2002 um, and worked as a lawyer for 10 years, primarily focusing in civil rights work and um, also doing some employment discrimination work and representing victims of uh, sex abuse against the state um, and whatnot. So uh, I am really excited to be here once again. I look forward to answering more of your questions and happy to leave materials that, that describe a little bit more about my background um, for you all to enjoy later. <coughs> Great. So now we have our four prepared questions. These are two-minute answers. And David, will you start sheet. with? Oh, I'm sorry. The, you have a sheet in front of you that's upside down. Feel free to turn it right side up, and you can read along with our four prepared questions as we go along. Okay. Great. So David, number one. Are you sure it's me? I'm sure it's you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing, rent control, others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? Well, I think as we move forward in terms of keeping um, Seattle affordable, we have to keep all of the options that are listed there on the table. There are two uh, that I there are two things that I want to point out that are critical to me. The first is that I think we need to continue supporting the housing levy. It's going to come up for annual in 2016. I think it's critically important for us to make sure that we're, we get behind that. Um, you know, for, currently in Seattle, for every one dollar that is spent, uh, the levy leverages four dollars for affordable housing um, and, and affordable housing development. And I think that. One thing that we need to keep in mind as we move forward is that certainly we need to grow the the, the, the levy, but you know, so for example, going from $20 million to $40 million doesn't necessarily translate into doubling the number of affordable units in the city. So we have to be really thoughtful about how we're going to uh, get funding from other areas to make sure that we're able to leverage our tax dollars effectively. Now, um, um, the, the second thing that I would like to point out there is with regard to developer fees. I do think that developer fees are both necessary and appropriate to be able to help us uh, move forward with the affordable housing crisis that we're currently in. And, and, and frankly, I think that developers can be a very powerful partner for us in moving, moving the needle forward on the affordability um, issue. And I, I think really what it's going to come down to is figuring out what the balance will be between the fees charged to the developers and, um, and the type of incentives that the city's going to be willing to give developers in order to do that type of work. And so I'm looking forward to getting the report uh, from the HALA committee to be able to uh, really study what that balance should be and um, help the city move forward. Great. Elizabeth, number two. Last year, voters approved the levy to fund the Universal Preschool Pilot Program. After the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of the program? What policy changes would you make to ensure this plan addresses educational disparities? So, I think first and foremost, really supportive of the, of the pre-K plan that was approved but overwhelmingly by the voters in November. I think it's a great step forward. Currently, the way that the four-year pilot is structured, we would ramp up to 2018 to serve 2,000 um, kids. And I, I think the approach that has been laid out is a methodical one. I think it's a very thoughtful one. Um, and I think we need to continue to look at the pilot program to make sure that, that we're going to have the results that we see in, in places like Boston and New Jersey, which are considered to be very successful pre-K programs. Um, currently in the city, we have about 12,003 year olds in the city and that number is growing really fast. 
past in our city. And, um, and I think that, that that just means that we have a long way to go in terms of from 2000 to you know, serving all of the 12,000 and growing, we have a way to go before we get to universal pre-K. But I think that's where we need to move the pilot to. I think the question will be is how do we take it to scale um, in a timely way, but without compromising the deliberate results to low-income neighborhoods and to low-achieving um, low um, neighborhoods and to other people who want to access the pre-K system. So I think that right now that the, the funding, the expiration of the levy is in 2018, and that's going to provide us an opportunity to sort of both take a look at the success of the program and look at other funding sources. Ultimately, I'm hoping that in the future, whatever levy dollars we are able to get out of a renewal of a proposal, um, if our pilot program is, is successful, is that we'll be able to leverage every dollar that we use that is a city taxpayer dollar with federal money, state money, and even philanthropic um, money. And in all those sector, sectors, we are seeing an increased amount of interest in funding pre-K, and we need to be ready to do that. Great. Liz, number three. Uh, number three, Bertha is still stuck. What options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns in waterfront transit and an unsafe violence? So I think that the city's primary responsibility with regard to Bertha is public safety. And um, I, I think we need to make sure that the city is implementing and executing a trust but verify approach on anything related to the viaduct. Um, you know, I know that the city has hired its own experts to, uh, to ensure and watch and monitor that the viaduct continues to be a safe, um, a safe way to get in and out of the city and through the city. I think that was a, a smart choice to make, but again, we need to make sure that at every juncture, we as a city have, again, a trust but verified approach when it comes to wash lot the, and, and, the, and the moving forward of that program. Secondly, with regard to the Washington State Department of Transportation, I think the state has a, a tantamount duty to make sure that they are transparent with us, the public, about how the, um, the project is going. Um, and, both, and that means fiscally, and that certainly means in terms of public safety impact and, and risk associated with that. So that if there is any soil settlement or any other structural issues related to that bridge, the city can take the action that they need to take that is commensurate with whatever the concern is to make sure that our people in the, who live in the city and travel through the city remain um, remain safe. And, uh, and I think lastly, I would just say that I think in terms of cost overruns, again, that's a trust but verify approach is what I'm calling it. But, but at the same time, I think that we as a city need to make sure that we're monitoring our own project, which is the seawall. And we need to make sure, which is critically important to not only the success of Bertha moving forward, but also to the public safety component. So we need to make sure that we meet our own obligations and not be distracted by Bertha. Maria, number four. Seattle is the fastest growing big city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth? And what policy changes are necessary to accommodate growth? Um, I don't think there's anything we can do to discourage growth. So I, 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 don't, I don't, I think growth is happening because we're such a great city and um, short of telling people to stay out, I'm not sure how we can stop the growth. The question to me is how do we manage the growth that we're currently expecting and anticipating and are experiencing as a city? And I think the, the, the underlying issues around affordability are not being able to get around easily and how that impacts our quality of life, not, um, you know, being nervous about uh, affordability and whether or not we're going to be able to continue living here um, and, and retain our diversity and our character and, and who we are and how we define ourselves as a city. Um, and lastly, you know, what it means in terms
terms of understanding that the middle class is shrinking and that means we need a stronger safety net for those that are the most vulnerable in our community. And, and with growth comes a challenge in each one of those, those buckets. And so I think we need to really, uh, when we take a close look in terms of policy um, at where we're investing our taxpayer dollars, we need to ensure that our budget is going to reflect those progressive values around ensuring that, again, we have a strong safety net for the most vulnerable and that we are also promoting policies that are truly going to achieve things like income um, equality and um, affordable housing. And these are all long-term strategies that are going to take a long time to achieve, but I do think that they can, they can be done in our city. Great. So now we'll open it up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. So Elizabeth, Joseph, and Sarah. So um, you currently are working in the mayor's office and you have a great job. So why do you want to leave that job and become city councilman? So I'm not at the mayor's office anymore. Uh -huh. I left my my post as a senior advisor and legal counsel. This is my fourth week of unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and and I, I was very happy to, to do that to be able to focus on the campaign full time. I want to run for Seattle City Council because I think I bring very strong leadership skills and um, with that combined with my legal training and with my, my deep involvement with a lot of community-based organizations and a diverse array of, of neighborhoods and by diverse I mean both an in interest and socioeconomic and race and ethnicity in our city. And I think that also my background growing up as, as somebody who grew up uh, overcoming the challenges and boundaries, both in education and society, that are associated, typically associated with poverty, I think are all issues that are not, or perspectives that are not fully represented on the city council. And I want to be able to put those skills to the test, and I want to, I want to put them to good use and uh, make sure that our city moves in the right direction. So Joseph and Sarah. Uh, which one sitting city council member do you most respect and why? Um, it is. <laughs> I can't take the mom answer. Like they're all my favorite children. But <laughs> Just one. Love all my children, yeah. but <laughs> um, I, I, one that I respect the most. Um, gosh, it's a hard one. It really is hard. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I have to say, and this might be a surprise, but um, but I have to say that uh, that I have a great amount of respect for council members along. And I'll, I say that for the following reason, is that I may not agree with her approach to how to solve policy solutions all the time, and I may not agree with even some of her policy decisions or, or direction. But I do respect the fact that she fundamentally understands who her constituency is, who she represents, and what her values are. And I, I would aspire to adopt those values, those that type of framework. Uh, Sarah, then Evan. I will add you to the list. Sarah, Evan, then Mary. So <laughs> Mayor Murray, I'm so nine and a half blocks. I would be the title address downtown street crime center. So I just wondered why her approach that would be, and also uh, in regards to the county prosecutor Dan Satterberg, who's been kind of charging some low level drug crimes, not as felonies as misdemeanors, or even in support of that, and providing more mental health services, et cetera. Um, what, what would your approach be for the crime issue? Yeah, public safety in general. Um, so, so I was at the mayor's office when we, when the nine and a half block strategy was being. Um, designed, and I think that where it came from was just a, a, a real feeling that something significant needed to be done to address uh, crime in the downtown area. Now, as part of that, if we're going to have any sort of law enforcement or increased enforcement strategy, um, we need to make sure that we are, we're not just funneling people into the criminal justice system and that we're actually matching up people with human services that they actually need that are leading them to, um, to be in the circumstances that they're in. 
So LEAD, I think, is a great, great, fantastic, innovative program that I think you know, we need to make sure that we take it to scale, but do it in a responsible way. Um, so again, I think if we're, gonna, if we're going to be looking at, um, uh, at enforcing the laws, we need to make sure that we're doing it in a way where we're not disparate and that we're actually addressing the root cause of mental health needs, for example. Evan and then Mary. Um, Seattle has a particularly abysmal high school graduation rate for students of color, and I'm wondering if that you could talk a little bit about what we might be able to do to change that. Mm -hmm. So this is a, an issue that is really important to me. Um, I, I grew up in a town where, when I was in high school, I asked uh, my counselor how I could go about finding out how to go to college, like where would I start? Because I, did, I only had one older sister that had gone to college, and I just didn't know where to go. And her response to me was that people like me don't go to college. So the issue of making sure that students, and particularly students of color, have a clear pathway and an understanding of what they can achieve through further education is really important to me. And if there's one thing I can do on the city council, it would be to make sure that the city is, is assuming its responsibility to um, provide wraparound services, what I would call wraparound services for, for kids, so that, for example, when kids get popped out of the school district because of disciplinary reasons, that they have a place to go. That we're not just throwing our hands up and giving up on those folks. And then, of course, workforce development to make sure that those kids who aren't going to go to college because they don't want to um, have a different path. Mary, and then I have one, and David. Uh, we worked in the mayor's office, and, and maybe it was less than a year or so, because he hasn't been there that long. But, um, you probably worked in more than one area, but if not, what would you especially work in? Mm -hmm. And then, are there any areas in which you would uh, support a different policy than what the mayor is doing or has been? In many areas of disagreement. Um, so, I worked at the mayor's office where I think just a, just a little over 10 months, might have been 11 months. And, um, and I worked on a variety of issues when I was there as his legal counsel. It was sort of my job to make sure that not just he, but his entire office were um, moving their policies forward in compliance with code and constitutional law and all that fun stuff. And I, I worked on a lot of things. I, I, was, I was staffed on the executive labor committee that dealt with labor negotiations for city unions. Um, I wrote the priority hire legislation on behalf of his office. Um, with one of the departments and other staff um, and worked with city council to make sure that got through. So there are a lot of different issues. So areas of, areas of disagreement, I'm not sure that I would say, you know, I think since I was there, we, we passed the transit lobby, pre-K, $15 minimum wage, um, and, and a few other things, and all of those things are things that I obviously agree with. I think when it, it, I saw my job as his legal counsel to make sure that um, that I uh, gave him the information he needed to make the decisions that he needed to make. And so I wasn't really in a position to disagree with him. I was in a position to give him counsel that sometimes he didn't take. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, I have a question then, David. So um, on this election, Seattle is currently uh, getting signatures for Initiative 122, which would um, put on the ballot a public financing system for city elections. Uh, have you signed? Do you support it? And how do you think that would how how would it change city elections? So I do support public financing of campaigns. And uh, I was on the Seattle Ethics and Elections Commission as a commissioner for, I think, a little over two years um, and had an opportunity in that role to actually look at the prior proposal that wasn't ultimately accepted by the voters and uh, provided sort of preliminary advice. To, it was Council Member O'Brien who was sponsoring the legislation on that piece. So incredibly supportive of it. Definitely think we need to get you know, money and big corporations at politics. I think that's an important value. Um, I don't, I frankly don't know enough about honest elections um, to, to be a proponent of it or to be supportive of it at this point. Um, I would be, I think the, the idea of giving folks vouchers, $100 worth of vouchers, is that it's certainly an innovative one. It's very different than anything that is being proposed anywhere else in the country. Um, and I, I would 
want to be careful about what the details are around that to make sure that we're not creating an um, unintended consequences with that. So I would want to study it some more before deciding. Fair, thank you. Uh, David. <clears throat> um, I'm intrigued by biography. Yeah, and I'm just wondering uh, if you could, would mind sharing uh, with us a little bit about uh, how you uh, made that, uh, where you found the resources, mm -hmm. the motivation, the gumption, uh, uh, to make that transition from the fields of uh, central Washington you know, to the halls of academia in Coleman, Washington, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, how'd you pull that off? Yeah. So the key, I, the, I don't have a, 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 I get asked this question a lot, and I don't have a, a, you know, the, the, the game changer answer, but I, I have suspicions. One is my parents were tremendous hard workers. They immigrated into this country in the early 60s because they believed that the American dream was achievable. And for us, it was. For many, it still isn't. But for us, it certainly was. And they made a huge amount of sacrifices to leave the only country and all the family they knew back home and, and to move to this foreign country where they didn't know the system, the language, or the culture. And I will be internally grateful for them for making that sacrifice. Secondly, I had access to pre-K. I went to Head Start, which was a state-funded pre-K program for migrant farm workers. And I think that that made all of the difference in my world to put me onto the path that I am on now. And, um, and, and I think that those, those are the two things that really sort of led to shape me who I am. And of course, just work ethic and knowing what that means. And, um, and uh, probably being a little bit of stubborn as well in terms of um, determined to achieve and make my parents proud. So we are out of time, but if you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. That was fast. It was fast. Um, so again, thank you so much for having me here and for asking such thoughtful questions. Um, I'm really, I am really truly excited about, about being on the city council and about tackling these issues and about doing that in a way that is very collaborative, um, but of course also one that is oriented towards action because I think that's what we're really going to need. One of the reasons I'm running for the citywide seats is because, uh, again, I think um, I have a very strong passion for working on these bigger, harder to solve um, issues and challenges that are facing our city. And I hope to get your endorsements so that I'm able to, uh, to do that work. Great. Thank you very much.